3D printing, also known as additive manufacturing. Now, there are various technologies one can be referring to when talking about 3D printing, but we're going to focus on the fused filament fabrication, FFF method. This is also known as the FDM or fused deposition modeling method, but let's not get caught up with the acronyms. Both refer to the same process. It's the type of 3D printing where plastic is fed through a heated nozzle and precisely deposited to build a part from the ground up. Some people also refer to this process as magic. Let's go into the workflow and talk about how exactly do you turn a digital file into a physical part. I'll quickly summarize the workflow and then I'll explain each step in a little more detail. You start with a 3D model which you'll want to export as an STL file. STL is kind of like the JPEG of 3D printing. It's just the most commonly used format. You'll bring the STL file into a separate program called a slicer that will, well, slice the model into horizontal layers. The slicer will spit out a G-code file and this G-code file is what you'll feed into your 3D printer and the 3D printer will print or more accurately manufacture your part. Okay, that was a lot of info way too fast. So as I promised, let's go back and discuss each step a little more. We'll start here at the beginning, the 3D model. How exactly do you get a 3D model? Well, most people who are just getting into 3D printing will start by downloading other people's designs. There are websites you can go to where people create designs and then upload them for the community to freely download and print. Thingiverse is one of the most popular sites, but there are much, much more. This is a great way to get started, but it gets a little old after a few days, and eventually you'll want to start designing your own models. Which brings us to the second way to get a 3D model. Make your own. If you follow my channel, then you know that I'm a big fan of Fusion 360, but that's just one of a multitude of design software available. I'll include a link below to a much bigger list, some free and some not so free. As I had mentioned, downloading and printing other people's design is a great way to start, but designing your own models is just way more fun and much more rewarding. Okay, let's move on to the slicer. If you design your own model, there will be an option to export it as an STL file. You're going to take that STL file and import it into a slicer, which is a separate software. The slicer does exactly as its name implies. It takes the STL file and slices it into horizontal layers that can be 3D printed. The end result is a new file type called a G-code file that will store all the instructions to tell your 3D printer how to build the part. Now, even though there are many different options for slicer programs, they are all going to require the same info from you. Next, I'll go over some of the main settings and explain the important terms and what they mean. First, the slicer is going to want to know what kind of material you're using. We call this filament and it comes in many different colors and flavors. I mean, chemistry. The most popular is PLA. It's the most forgiving and easiest to print with. Therefore, it's the one you want to start with. I highly recommend mastering PLA before moving to other types. ABS and PETG will give you stronger parts that can withstand higher temperatures than PLA, but are more finicky to print with. Nylon is great for strong, slippery parts such as gears, but even more finicky than ABS or PETG. There's also flexible rubbery filaments called TPU. These are great for a wide range of applications. And then there are the composites. These are mostly PLA mixed with other materials. Wood fill is wood fibers mixed with PLA that allow for 3D prints that look like wood and can be sanded and stained. There is also copper fill, bronze fill, and many more. There are just too many types of filament to mention here with the list growing daily, but I've included a more comprehensive list in the PDF download. The slicer will also ask for the resolution you want. In 3D printing, resolution refers to layer height, the thickness of each layer measured in the vertical or Z direction. Most objects are printed between 0.1 and 0.3 millimeters. Let's say you're trying to print this model. With a 0.3 millimeter resolution, you're going to have more pronounced layers than you would with a 0.2 or 0.1 with 0.1 being the smoothest, but also taking the longest to print. Just as in life, there's always a trade-off here, and the trade-off is between quality and time. 
The slicer is going to ask you to set your infill. 3D prints are usually not printed solid. They have an internal structure that give them strength and allow for faster printing with less material. We have the option to set the density of that structure by selecting an infill percentage. If you're looking at a print from the top, this is what two different infill percentages would look like. The higher infill part is generally going to be stronger, but will take longer to print and use up more material than the part with less infill. If you wanted a hollow part, you could simply set the infill to zero. The slicer will also ask you for the number of shells. Shells refer to the outline or perimeter of the part. 3D prints are separated into two parts, the shell and the infill. As we mentioned in the previous slide, the infill is the interior pattern. The shell is the wrapping around that pattern. The default is normally set to two, but you have the option to change it. Generally speaking, more shells equals a stronger part. Build plates adhesion. There will be times when you're going to need some help getting your part to stick to the build plate. This will be the case with a long narrow part that doesn't have much surface contact. Looking from a top down view, the part on the left would be fine, but the one on the right may detach from the build plate halfway through printing. To prevent this, you enable what's called a brim. It's basically just a layer of material that attaches to your model and is spread out to give it more surface contact and anchor it to the build plate. From a front view, it would look like this. A brim would simply get removed when your print is completed. Rafts also help with build plate adhesion, but rafts are a little more robust. They involve multiple layers to create a surface mesh. Your part is then built on top of this surface mesh. Next, let's talk about supports. The important thing to keep in mind is this rule. You can't print on thin air. Let me explain. If I'm looking from a front view, printing this pyramid, for example, would be fine. But printing something that looks like this would result in this. The reason is easy to see if we take it step by step. While printing, it'll be built up layer by layer with the bottom layers supporting the top. However, when we get to this part, there's no bottom layer to support the next layer, and that's the recipe for making spaghetti. One way to address this is to enable supports, which are basically a system of pillars that hold up the part while it's being printed. These get removed once the print is complete. For beginners, it can be a little difficult to know what will or will not need supports, so I present the YHT rule to help you out. The arm of the Y is at 45 degrees, measured from the horizontal, and won't have any problems printing. Any shallower, and we can start seeing issues. The H represents the printer's ability to break that first rule of printing on thin air. This is known as bridging. If this leg wasn't here, then this print would be a failure. But having it allows this horizontal strand of filament to, well, bridge the gap and attach to it. However, as the gap increases, we can begin to see some sagging until we go too far and get failure. The T represents a problem in that there are no bottom layers to support the top as we saw in our previous example. However, there are ways we can address this. We can design a fillet or a chamfer to the part, but the simplest ways to solve the T problem would be to flip it so that it prints upside down. Many printing problems can simply be solved by reorienting your part on the build surface. Look to this solution before relying on supports. Here's a time-lapse video of printing the YHT model. Notice the Y prints with no supports and the printer is able to create a perfect bridge on the H. However, take a look at the T and you can see the result of not having bottom layers to support the top layers. Now for some general random tips to help you avoid some beginner pitfalls. If you're on the market for a 3D printer, one with a heated bed will be better than one without a heated bed. A heated bed will allow your material to better adhere to it and will open up the option of printing with other materials once you've mastered PLA. When designing two parts that are meant to fit together, you need to consider the issue of tolerance. Basically, you can't design the peg and the hole to be the same size. You'll need to design the hole a little bit bigger or the peg a little bit smaller. You would want to run some tests with your printer, but generally a 0.2 millimeter difference will give you a tight friction fit 
while a 0.4 millimeter tolerance would allow for a loose fit. If quality is important, consider flipping your part to print in a vertical orientation rather than horizontal. The horizontal resolution will be limited to the size of your nozzle. Most printers come with a default 0.4 millimeter nozzle as opposed to getting 0.1 layer height as a vertical resolution. The weakest point of our part will be along the layer lines. Try to orient your part so that the layer lines are perpendicular to the anticipated stresses. Flipping a part 90 degrees can result in a significantly stronger part. Unless it's required for your part, avoid sharp corners if you can help it. Making your corners rounded by adding small fillets will allow for smoother and better prints. Sharp corners can also be prone to peeling off the build plate. If you found this video helpful, then make sure to download my accompanying 3D printing resource PDF guide, where I've included a list of websites that offer free downloadable models, a list of design software so that you can be on your way to making your own models, a list of slicer software available, and a 3D printing filament guide. I've also included my recommendations on the best tools you'll need to get started. Click on the download link below to get it.